Okay, good afternoon, students. We're now going to be diving into our second book, uh, Glittering Vices by Rebecca DeYoung. Full disclosure, Rebecca DeYoung is a good friend of mine. Um, I think this book is really important. A couple of preliminary points I want to make here. First, some of you are not Christian, or maybe you're moderately Christian, or something like that, or whatever. Maybe some of you don't even believe in God's existence. Um, that's fine. So as you're reading this book, I want you to think of, I want you to have two different things in mind. First thing to have in mind is, uh, this book is still applicable to you. Because as I'll present many of these vices, I'll present them uh, in ways that are not obviously sort of saturated in the Christian tradition. I will talk about their saturation in the Christian tradition as well, but you can easily uh, apply them to your life even if you're not a Christian. So don't use that as an excuse that this book is written by a Christian and in general for Christian audiences. Uh, it's beside the point you are clever enough to easily be able to get something from it independently of that audience. Second of all, uh, this is a great opportunity for those of you who are not Christians to see something that the Christian tradition has taught for a long time and that the Christian tradition is now sort of rediscovering and reteaching and re-emphasizing in a lot of works lately. So the virtue-vice tradition is... Uh, really, really, really growing again. It's becoming very, very popular amongst Christians. And so this is a way, this is a nice window into historic Christianity and a sort of burgeoning movement within contemporary Christianity. So keep those things in mind. This is applicable to you, whether you're Christian or not. And this is a nice window into a, a very, very robust, deep Christian tradition. Okay, the other preliminary point I want to make is the connection between our readings that we've done so far. So the allegory of the cave sort of chastised us and told us that we're all living in caves and we need to make an effort to get out of it. And remember that effort to get out of the cave is really not so much moving our bodies as moving our hearts. It's not so much moving our limbs and turning our heads, it's turning our souls towards things that matter. It's rearranging our loves. That's what the allegory suggested. And then we moved on to a refutation of moral relativism. And we discovered that really, probably the way most of us think, uh, most of us think in, in some relativistic ways, right? We have inclinations towards relativism. And if Isa's right, those inclinations are not good. Those inclinations are probably, if Isa's right, motivated much more by selfishness, by self-serving desires than they are by a deep desire for the truth. And so, again, think about the connection between that and the allegory. The allegory says, wake up, people, you're living in caves, seek the truth, turn your heart and your mind, your life towards caring about things that matter. And then in a refutation of moral relativism, we learn that most of us, many of us, at least at various times and in various places, don't really care about things that matter. Uh, and so a refutation of moral relativism is supposed to get you to care about that issue, moral relativism versus moral absolutism. Now as we move on, we, we're going to be talking about the virtues and the vices, and what this is doing is this talk about the virtues and vices really does presuppose uh, the previous book. The previous book has laid a foundation. That foundation, if you agree with Isa, that foundation says that there really are moral facts, moral truths, moral rules, standards that exist independently of our feelings, our desires, our beliefs, our psychological states. They're there for us to discover, not to invent. And then what this next book is, is this book is going to now put flesh on those bones. So a refutation of moral relativism gave us a foundation, but it didn't give us the structure. It didn't give us the house or the furnishings of that structure. This book's going to give us the structure and some of the furnishings. Uh, you can think of it like this, a refutation of moral relativism gave us a skeleton, right? It gave us a framework, right? It gave us the bones. Glittering Vices is now going to put some flesh on those bones to give us some real direction for how to live our lives. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post to the blog various exercises that you can do while we're reading through this, and if you do those exercises and write about it, I will give you extra credit for the class. The exercises are, in many cases, somewhat demanding 
Maybe some of the exercises are fasting for 48 hours or 24 hours or, uh, you know, some of the exercises might be going to a cemetery, um, you know, for an hour or, uh, you know, locking yourself in a room, making it dark, getting rid of all electronics and noise for an hour and staying awake, not falling asleep. So I'll give you a list of exercises and the point of the exercise and ways to reflect upon it, and you can do that for some extra credit. But the, the main idea I want to get across right here is, is just that. This book is going to provide us with some tools, with some, some more material for us to actually use in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay. Um, so a lot of connections here, right, right off the back, right off the bat, uh, we see our author, Rebecca DeYoung, talking about how she, here's a quote, an honest look at our, into, our own intellectual history requires that we listen carefully to wisdom of the past. That should sound familiar, right? Isa was very big on tradition. It's not that he thinks tradition is infallible. He just thinks we're idiots if we sort of discard tradition when it comes to morality and how to live. And what's fascinating is we do that, right? We don't do it when it comes to making cars or movies or airplanes or spaceships or computers or roads or really anything else. We look at the wisdom of the past and we try to build upon it in the sciences and everything else. But when it comes to our lives and how to live and what decisions to make, we kind of chuck all that out the window and try to go at it on our own. We don't look at the wisdom of our parents. My uh, I have a family member who's in an interesting dispute with uh, her son, and the son is saying, well, look, you made all these mistakes that I'm making, as if that's justification for making those very same mistakes, right? So this unwillingness to sort of learn from the mistakes of our parents, grandparents, and, and history. And so this book is, is saying, look, that's a mistake. We shouldn't do that, so let's retrieve something from Christian tradition. Another major thing, and this is, this is important, I'm going to emphasize this a lot, is the notion of naming. So, uh, right at the beginning, right, Dr. DeYoung gives this, this nice example of her own life where she says, uh, you know, she was struggling in graduate school, then she started reading some Thomas Aquinas and came upon this vice called pusillanimity. That's how to pronounce it, by the way. It's pusillanimity. And pusillanimity, or smallness of soul, was a name that Dr. DeYoung could now give to this struggle she was going through. She now had a name for it. She could identify it. It no longer was mysterious and vague and foggy and fuzzy. She could name it, pin it down, think about it now, wrestle with it in her mind and in her heart. And that allowed her, that gave her tools now to overcome it because now by being able to name it and see the heart of it, the essence of this, of this vice, she could now figure out cures for it. She could discover remedies, ways of addressing that particular problem that she was experiencing. And so naming is very important. Think about it like this. In the Bible, the very, you know, one of the very first tasks given to Adam and then, and then uh, to Eve is naming, right? They're to name all of the creatures in the garden. We are still in the process of naming. We haven't named all the parts of the brain. I don't even think we've named all the parts of the eye. We certainly haven't named all of the various parts of the universe, right? Uh, we're still discovering maybe moral truths, so we haven't named all of those things. We're discovering various mathematical truths. We haven't named all of them. We're still in the process of naming, and naming is a, a, extremely important. Um, and so here's where the sort of physician analogy that Rebecca brings up that I'm going to emphasize a lot more than, uh, un, than some of the other analogies. So the physician analogy goes like this. Uh, the doctor, right, the, the physician, what does he do? Well, initially he looks at symptoms. And those symptoms may be, you know, they may be behavioral symptoms, some coughing. They may be physical symptoms, right? There's some spots, uh, some rashes. Uh, maybe there's some swelling, something like that. And then on the basis of those symptoms and maybe gathering as much data as possible, the physician attempts to make um, a kind of diagnosis, right? So here's the problem. So we've got symptoms, and then the symptoms give way to a diagnosis, and then the diagnosis gives way to some remedies, some cures for whatever it is that is ailing us physically. Well, that same, that same idea is highly applicable to the, our spiritual lives. 
And so the physician analogy is really, really important here. So think about the symptoms, our behavior, uh, maybe our thoughts, maybe our words, maybe our tone of voice. All of those things are symptoms. And those symptoms give way to a diagnosis. What's the issue? What's causing these behaviors in my life, in your life? And so that diagnosis then might reveal something great. It might reveal something very, very bad, very dangerous. And now think about it like this. Suppose our medical doctor, not our spiritual doctor, but suppose our medical doctor gives the wrong diagnosis. Suppose you go in, you've got some swelling in your throat, you've got a little bit of a cough, you, maybe you've got some, some uh, a rash on your arms, and the doctor says, oh, you've got cancer, you've got to get treatment right now, chemotherapy begins tomorrow. And suppose all you have is strep, right? So that is a misdiagnosis that actually could result in really, really, really bad consequences. Misdiagnosing the causes of the symptom can itself be deadly, right? So, so now suppose you go to the doctor and you've got a sore throat and you've got some rash on your hands and he says, oh, it's just strep throat, no big deal. And you've got cancer. That misdiagnosis there can also be deadly. So when we misdiagnose, right, the, the, the consequences can be very, very, very bad for our physical life. The same is true for our spiritual life. Suppose you're struggling with pornography, or suppose you're struggling with eating too much, or eating just all the time, you know, or alcoholism, or you're, you're struggling with vanity or something like that. And, and suppose suppose you go to someone, you try to get some help, you go to a counselor, a pastor, or something like that, and they, they uh, just try to fix the behavior and don't worry about the cause. Well, chances are that behavior is going to manifest itself again. Maybe, it, maybe new behavior will emerge because the underlying disease hasn't been dealt with. Or suppose they misdiagnose it. Suppose, you know, you're, you, you've been viewing pornography a lot and they diagnose that with um, spiritual sloth or they diagnose you with, uh, with just plain old lust. And suppose what's really going on is, um, I don't know, suppose, suppose you're, there's a kind of deep-seated boredom in your life, and pornography is sort of the cure for that or something. That, so, uh, or suppose you know, you're overspending, you're spending too much money on frivolous things, on uh, clothing and video games and, you know, making your car super look super cool or something like that and uh, and you're diagnosed with uh, greed right the 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 excessive desire for money and all of the things that money can buy and suppose the real problem actually with you isn't greed but it's vainglory you you're desperate for attention from others so if I diagnose you with greed I'm gonna treat you I'm gonna give you remedies cures for helping with greed not for helping with vainglory and the problem will persist and maybe get even worse because I've misdiagnosed you and then mistreated you. So just as it's crucial to get the diagnosis right and possibly deadly to get it wrong in the physical case, so too is it crucial to get the diagnosis right and possibly deadly to get it wrong in the spiritual case. So we've got symptoms, we've got a diagnosis, we've got then remedies. We've got dangers all over the place with misdiagnoses, misprescription of remedies and cures. So we need to learn uh, how to name the disease properly, to name the causes of our behaviors properly, and then learn the names of cures. So naming is so important in our day-to-day -day lives. It's so important in our, in our spiritual life here as well. Uh, notice again the relevance of metaphysics. Isa really harped on this right at the end of the refutation of moral relativism, that ethics in the tradition that he's thinking of is dependent upon metaphysics. So how I ought to live depends upon what I am, what type of creature I am. You know, here's an obvious, obvious uh, example. Think about abortion. Should, is it okay for us to uh, eliminate, for us to intentionally eliminate abort that thing growing in that woman. Is that permissible? Well, you might think the answer to that question depends on what it is. Is it just uh, an appendage? Is it just like, you know, a, a tumor, a lump of tissue that is growing inside the woman? Or is it, uh, you know, is it a, 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 a human? Is it a, an independent substance that is growing within that woman or, or a human being and, and you might think look if the answer is it's a human being 
then that's going to to result in a very different answer than if it's you know a lump of tissue so what are we right matters and so it matters here too um, the virtues and the vices which we're going to be studying are really about the so the virtues are things that you have to have in order to live a flourishing good uh, a significant life you got to have these things to live to have a good life a flourishing uh, joyous life meaningful happy life vices are whatever it is that takes away from that that results in a life that is less than flourishing less than meaningful and significant less than good right so the vices are character traits that we acquire that make our lives uh, uh, move towards worthlessness move towards meaninglessness uh, move towards emptiness uh, move towards misery move towards badness that's what the vices are right so acquiring the vices makes me makes me bad acquiring the virtues makes me good and we can apply this to any old thing right so think about this with pens i often use pens as examples i love pens so think about a pen i've got a pen in my pocket here's a pen right we can think about the virtues of a pen what are some of the virtues of a pen what in other words what are the features that a pen needs to have in order it for in order for it to be good for it in order for it to be a good pen well it needs to be light you know, imagine if this pen was 100 pounds. That would suck as a pen. It needs to be safe. Right? Imagine every time I touched the pen, it exploded. Or imagine the pen was designed so that it was razor blades all over it. So every time I touched it, I sliced my fingers. That's a crappy pen. Right? So those are vices for pens. The virtues of pens are, you know, it needs to deliver ink in a steady but controlled manner. It needs to be lightweight. Uh, it, need not, it, it shouldn't leak. Uh, it needs to last for a decently long period of time. You know, if I write one dot and the pen runs out of ink, that's not a good pen, and so on and so forth. So we can think of the virtues of a pen, the virtues of an eye, the virtues of a heart, right? Those are the things that are needed in order to make those things fulfill their function properly. The vices are things that inhibit the object from fulfilling its function properly. So the virtues for a human are going to be what are necessary in order to live a flourishing, fully functioning human life. The vices are those things that inhibit humans from living a flourishing, fully functioning human life. Okay, so a vice, now this is very important, I'm going to come back to this a lot, probably many of you are going to make some mistakes here and you will lose points on the final in your paper if you do. You do not have the a virtue. You don't have the virtue of courage or honesty or generosity or wisdom or love or faith or whatever. You don't have those virtues unless you don't have th that particular virtue unless it's become a habit, an acquired trait of yours. Aristotle talks about this as second nature. You don't have the virtue of generosity unless being generous has now become second nature to you so that you do it without thinking, without reflection. Now, you're not going to get the virtue of generosity unless you start off by reflecting and thinking, okay, should I be generous here? What, is this, what does this situation require I give? How should I give of my time, give of my money, give of my possessions? What does generosity require? So you do that for weeks, months, maybe years, and all of a sudden, you just find yourself, boom, 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 you're, you're, you're giving at the right time, in the right place, the right amount, towards the right people, and you're doing it without hesitation. You're doing it without thinking. It's just second nature, second nature. Boom, you've got the virtue of generosity. You don't have the virtue of generosity until it becomes so embedded within you that you do it unhesitatingly. Similar for the vices. Most of us are engaging in behaviors right now in our lives that if we persist in them, we will gain a vice. And the vice, right, you don't get the vice, just like you don't get the virtue, until it becomes second nature, until it becomes habitual, until it becomes, until you do it unreflectively, unhesitatingly, right? So, you know, think of, um, I don't know, think of the vice of pusillanimity. Let's look at that one. I don't want to dive into the ones we're going to study more in depth. Think of the vice of pusillanimity. So, you know, you might think like, oh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to volunteer for that, or no, I'm not going to take that leadership role here, or, 
no, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not smart enough. I'm not cool enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not handsome enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not, right? And so you're constantly shrinking back. You're constantly pulling yourself back from challenges and whatnot. You are engaging in behavior that if you persist, that will become habitual and you'll just start thinking of yourself along those lines. You'll start constantly pulling yourself and you'll do so unreflectively. You'll do so unhesitatingly. It will be second nature to you to see yourself in that way and to engage in behaviors like that just on a regular basis. When you get there, you've got the vice. But you don't have the vice until it becomes that. Okay? Now, there's a large Christian tradition. I'm not going to go into any depth here, but there's a large Christian tradition that says, look, vices are incompatible with being a Christian. If you have a vice, you are not a Christian. You're not saved. So you can't have a vice and be saved. You can't have a vice and have been raised from the dead in Christ. You can't have a vice and have been uh, brought to life by the Holy Spirit. That's a significant tradition. That's a significant strand of the Christian tradition. Not all Christians agree with that, but it's important to recognize that if you really are a Christian, chances are you don't have a vice, but you may be on your way to acquiring one if you continue to engage in the habits that you are. So this is deadly stuff, hence the seven deadly sins. Okay, so you've got the you've got all of the characteristics, all of the features for what a vice and what a virtue is. These are virtues are excellences of character. Uh, they are necessary in order for us to live flourishing, meaningful, significant, fully functioning lives. They're acquired traits. We acquire them through habit. They are supposed to become second nature to us so that we engage in virtuous behavior without thinking. We just do it automatically, but we don't acquire the virtue unthinkingly. We have to do a lot of thinking and reflection before we acquire the virtue, but ultimately once we got it, it's second nature. We just engage in virtuous activity. Same with vice, same with viciousness. Right? A vice is an acquired trait. It is uh, an inhibitor of function of fully function being a fully functioning human it is an inhibitor of flourishing if you have a vice you cannot live a good life it's not possible on this tradition it's not possible to have a vice and and, and be a good human you you can have a vice and be a good business person maybe you could have a vice and be a good baseball player you could have a vice and be a good artist but you can't have a vice and be a good human because vices are just those things that that, that make it impossible to flourish as a human, to fully function as a human. It's like, it's like saying I've got great eyesight and I'm blind. That's incoherent. Uh, so, you, so on this tradition, you can't have a vice and, and be a good human. You could be good other things, but you can't be a good human. So vices are acquired through habit, through repetition, uh, repetitious behavior, repetitious thinking, repetitious feeling. Our emotions play a large role here, too. The virtue tradition is not down on emotions. Isa, Isa often wrote like emotions were somehow bad. I'm not a fan of that way of thinking. In the virtue tradition, uh, uh, emotions are clues, pointers to, to who we are. Uh, if I get too angry too quick at the wrong time in the wrong place, this is very revealing about who I am and what's gone wrong in my life. An example that Rebecca uses to illustrate this is the sledding example. Uh, you need to know that example. I'm not going to talk about it. I like this. I like sporting examples. I played sports most of my life. And so like think about baseball. I know we've got at least one baseball player in here, maybe others. Think about basketball. But you know, for a baseball player, right? You're taught your whole life a particular way to stand, right? You want your elbow up, right? You want uh, your weight to be um, you know, placed in a proper way, and you want it to shift just at the right time, right? You want to keep your eye on the ball, right? You want your swing to be level. You don't want chopping swings. Um, you want level swings, eye on the ball the entire time. You want to shift your body, right? Um, and all of that, you're being trained in little league, in high school. You're being, right, those habits of swinging and holding a baseball bat are being drilled into you. Now imagine if you step up to the plate, and every time you step up, you're like, okay, eye on the ball, shoulder down, elbow up, weight must shift, lean back, get ready to step, here it comes. Oh, you're not going to be as successful. What you want is you want all of those virtues of baseball swinging 
you want of, of swinging a baseball bat, you want all of those virtues to become habitual, second nature, where you get up to the bat and boom, it's just habit. It just you know exactly how it feels. It feels right. It feels right to shoot the ball like this. You're not shooting with two hands. You're shooting with one hand. This other hand's just a prop. It's just a balance, right? Uh, you want it's just second nature. You're just doing it unhesitatingly, without thought. Now imagine if you build in bad character traits, right? So that so that when you're at bat, right, your shoulder isn't down, your 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 chin isn't down, your elbow isn't up, it's it's just down, right? If that becomes ha if that becomes second nature, it's going to take away in general, it's going to take away from having a good baseball swing or having a good basketball shot, right? So, uh the the point here is you're going to become a better, better basketball player, baseball player if you acquire the excellences of, you know, swinging a baseball bat, shooting a basket, and they become second nature to you so that you do those things without hesitation. Um, let's see, some other things, you know, the, the, the introduction talks also about uh, the seven virtues, and the seven virtues are just the four cardinal virtues that we saw in interview 11 plus the th three theological virtues i'm not going to go over those right now um let's move on to the the first chapter and here i'm going to be very quick i'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the this chapter i'm not going to go over the history with you other than to point out the tree metaphor i love the tree metaphor i'm going to ask you to draw trees you you can draw a tree at various stages, and perhaps on the final, I'll have you draw a completed tree. But so think about the tree metaphor. What's at the root of the tree? We've got pride at the root, right? This usurpation of God, this attempt to remove God, this attempt to be God in my life. I am the dictator. I am the one who determines what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. This is what Isa talked about, right, at the beginning of a refutation of moral relativism. This idea that I get to determine what is right and wrong. I get to decide what is good and bad. I am the inventor, not the discoverer, right? That's a kind of pride. I am God of my life. I submit to no one but David. Um, so, so, so pride, we'll talk a little bit more about pride, but we've got the tree, and at the root of the tree, or you might think of it, it's the root plus the sort of, the, the sort of massive trunk. That's pride. And then out of pride grow forth these branches. And the branches are the vices. And those vices are envy, vainglory, gluttony, greed, sloth, lust, blah, 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 right? Okay, so, so those are the vices. Those are branches that grow out of pride. And so some of us might struggle with one with with a particular vice and others might not struggle with it but they struggle with a different vice often that's how it that's how it goes and the way i like thinking about it is these are just various different manifestations of pride so sloth is a different manifestation of pride greed is a different manifestation of pride lust is a different manifestation of pride it's pride growing itself and some of us have really 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 thick lust branches or greed branches or vainglory branches um and then those branches those branches produce fruit and the fruit is typically observable behavior or psychological features right so my constant dwelling on tasty food and wanting food and organizing my life on food that's going to result in observable behavior but you're not going to observe all the stuff going on in my head all the time Nevertheless, that there is psychological, right? There's psychological states that I am in, and those states are fruits of the vi the vice of gluttony. You wanting attention all the time is a right. It's going to manifest it manifest itself in various behaviors, and that that so those are the fruit. They're often called the offspring vices or the daughter vices. Okay, so we've got this root, the root grows into a tree with seven branches and then each branch each branch produces fruit and that fruit is often observable behavior or various psychological states ways of thinking habits of mind that we have okay so that tree metaphor is really really nice i'll try to maybe i'll link to one of the old ancient tree drawings there's some great drawings 
uh, uh, Rebecca talks about, and this is the last thing I'll mention here, the distinction between the capital vices and the seven deadly sins. And really, it's just a different terminology. Protestants were a little reluctant to embrace the language of deadly sin because Protestants denied a Roman Catholic distinction between what are called mortal sins and venial sins. Mortal sins made shipwrecks of our soul. They sort of destroyed our faith and our relationship to Christ. Whereas other sins didn't do that, but they, they just sort of uh, impaired our relationship with Christ. Protestants typically thought that when you were saved, when you were brought out of spiritual death and into spiritual life, you couldn't die again. But sins would inhibit and get in the way of a right relationship with God and thereby make your life less and less beautiful, less and less glorious and good less and less flourishing. Um, and so the capital vices just means, right, these are the, the, the capital, right, this is the head, the fountain from which flows all other sins. Okay. Do not confuse the vices with sin. Sin is typically, we, we typically use the word sin to pick out a particular act, right? So murder is a sin. Being murderous, having murderous thoughts is a vice, or can be a vice if it's become second nature. Okay, I think that's it for the intro and chapter one. I'll see you soon.